they lose six years off their lifespan, and they get exactly the same list of diseases as the people who do night shift work, all right, or have sleep apnea. All right, why is that? These things are feeding into the same biological pathways, okay, and that's where they deliver uh, their benefits. Okay, so circadian rhythms are really crucial. Uh, all of these things, uh, it, most of our lifestyle influences on health work through our circadian rhythms. All right, now why are circadian rhythms so crucial? Well, uh, think of these uh, deaf, dumb, and blind movers trying to move a sofa. All right, they have no ears and mouths, so they can't talk to each other. All right, but they need to lift at the same time, they need to walk in the same direction, or else the sofa is going to fall down. All right? So they need to coordinate their activities, but if they can't communicate, how do they do it? All right? And uh, our cells are in that situation. Our cells need to cooperate with all the other cells. They need to achieve biological things that they can't do alone. They need to do it with a cluster of other cells, like an organ. Um, everybody needs to be working together, but uh, they need to all do it at the same time. They need to be all be running the same program. And how do they achieve that? Uh, they achieve it through clocks. All right? And they all have to have their clocks synchronized. If they don't have their clocks synchronized, uh, then they won't do it. So all of our cells, they've got a biological program. At this time of day, I'm going to do this. All right? And if all of our cells are, uh, have the same time, uh, then they'll be able to interact with each other successfully and all the functions, all of our bodily functions will be executed well. All right. How do we give time to those clocks? All right. How do we get all the clocks ticking and all of them synchronized? Well, there are five main ways. All right. One of them is light exposure. One is exposure to ambient temperature. Uh, one is through social interactions, one through exercise, one through meal timing. Okay, so let me talk a little bit more about each of those. Um, how does light give us our timing? Well, it turns out when uh, light, mostly blue light, but also ultraviolet light and a little bit of green, when it strikes our retina, uh, there are uh, some special receptors that send signals to uh, a part of the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, uh, which is where the so-called central clock is located. So it's the single most important clock in the body. Uh, and that uh, portion of the brain sends signals out to the rest of the body. This is what I think the time is. All right, so that's a very important clock. And what drives it? Um, blue light is really crucial. All right, and everything from about here on, uh, yellow up, uh, can affect it somewhat. Uh, but basically, red, orange, and yellow with no green is, uh, has no effect on the central clock, all right? So what does that mean? Uh, in the nighttime, you can use red, orange, yellow light with no problem, all right? It won't have any effect on your circadian rhythms. It won't tell your brain that it's daytime, okay? But in the daytime, you really need all this blue light. So whenever you're exposed to blue light, it's telling your body it's daytime, okay? So um, by day, you need to get sunlight. Uh, and when you're indoors during the day, you, you need to expose yourself to bright, full-spectrum lighting. All right? Now, what kind of lighting do people actually buy? If you look at these lights, uh, you'll see they have a yellowish tinge to them. All right? And that's the worst possible kind of lighting to buy. All right? Don't buy anything uh, that says cool white bulb. All right? that, that's uncool. Okay, what you want is, uh, you know, something with a color temperature of at least 5,500 Kelvin. And, uh, and it, should be, it should look a little harsh. It should look very bright, very blue. All right, like the, you know, think of the halogen headlights. Um, and what should things look like at night? They should look like a campfire. All right, campfire, uh, color temperature more like 600 Kelvin. All right, and it's very red, very yellow, uh, and very little blue, okay? So these yellow lights, they have too much blue, they'll disrupt your night, but they don't have enough blue to entrain your day. All right, so um, now it turns out 
uh, since Thomas Edison invented the light bulb, all right, he's uh, uh, you know, a great man in many ways, but he really damaged our health with that one. Um, so we now have uh, these light bulbs all around us at night. And uh, uh, it turns out that having all that light at night is probably uh, disrupting our health. And so, for instance, light exposure at night is closely tied to obesity rates. Um, so in this study, they split uh, light exposure up into three groups, a low light group, middle light third, and a high light uh, third. And the darker the light, you know, basically, uh, the people with middle amounts of light exposure at night had 10% less obesity than people with highest light, and the people with the lowest light exposure had 20% less obesity. And we know that circadian rhythm disruption causes obesity uh, in animals. So this is very consistent uh, with what we know. All right, temperature, really important. We want to be exposed to warmer temperatures in the day, cooler temperatures at night. Now, in our natural environment, outdoors, that happens automatically. There's no place in the world you can go where it's hotter at night than in the day. Okay, um, But now that we have artificial control of our environments, what do we do? Especially if you're in the south, uh, you put air conditioning on all day, uh, so it's cool. And you go through offices, the mall, everything's you know, very cold. Uh, and then you get home and you want to save money on energy, and so you turn the air conditioning off and now it gets warm. So you've reversed uh, the day-night cycle. All right, Food, extremely important. Uh, circadian rhythm and trainer. Uh, it's very important to do intermittent fasting, have an extended overnight fast. You should never eat any calories at night, and you should have at least a 12-hour night. So uh, once it's nighttime for you, don't eat any more calories. And you should actually extend the fast longer than 12 hours. So I generally do about 16, um, and I think that's about optimal. You have to be, make sure all of your food comes in in the daylight. All right. So what happens, these are two groups of mice. Uh, in this black line, uh, the mice had their, their food fed to them uh, equally throughout a 20, the 24 hours of the day. All right. And mice, when they get food, they just go eat it if they're hungry. And so these mice were eating all day, no circadian rhythm entrainment. Uh, the other mice, they got exactly the same food, all right? But it was just within a restricted window, eight-hour window. And what happens? They live 50% longer, all right? That gets back to what I said about the fasting. Our bodies really need a fasting period to go cannibalize themselves and clean up all the junk. And then they need a feeding period in which they reconstruct themselves. And you're short-circuiting that. If you're always feeding yourself through 24 hours, you're never cannibalizing yourself because uh, disposing of this food that came in is a higher metabolic priority, and it trumps that. All right. So if you're feeding all the time, uh, then you're never cleaning up your body, and it really shortens your lifespan. All right. Um, now also, meal timing when you eat. So you need to, you need to be on that uh, fasting feeding cycle, but then what's the optimal time to feed? Uh, it's between about noon and 4 p.m. All right, and, but you want to get all of your food intake in the daytime. Okay, and it turns out, uh, it used to be said that skipping breakfast was bad for your health. Uh, it turns out that's not true. Uh, skipping breakfast is good for you uh, because it helps concentrate your food intake, but skipping breakfast is terrible if it leads you to eat food at night. All right, so uh, late night eating is really bad for you. Uh, and leads to obesity and other problems, all right? But if you don't eat at night, uh, skipping breakfast is just fine. Um, all right, oh, one last thing about uh, uh, the uh, meal timing issue. This is another reason why diets tend to fail, all right? When people are trying to lose weight, uh, they wake up in the morning, their brain is fresh, they have a lot of willpower. And so they say, all right, I'm not gonna eat. Okay, so they restrict their eating, all right? And then as the day goes on, they get hungrier and hungrier. And uh, by the time it's nighttime, their brain is tired, so their willpower is lower, all right? 
And then they give it, they give in, and they start eating. So they're eating at night. And so what have they done? They totally re reverse the circadian rhythm. Uh, and they're feeding at night and fasting in the day. And that's very disruptive to their bodies, to their health, and it leads to weight gain. All right. Um, physical activity. All right, the keys in the daytime, we need to get exercise or activity. Uh, we need about 30 minutes of moderate intensity exercise per day. Moderate intensity is where you're working fairly hard, but it's comfortable and fun. You know, your, your breath, your heart rate are just about, if you, if you exerted yourself a little bit harder, your breath would get rapid, your, you know, your pulse would get too high, it would be unpleasant. Uh, you'd have to be, you'd feel like you were working hard. Go just below that point, that's moderate intensity. If you get 30 minutes per day, uh, then you're getting enough to entrain circadian rhythms. If you do it every day over time, it builds up a level of fitness. Uh, this is from a, a long-running study uh, started in the 1970s where they give people a treadmill test to assess their fitness. Uh, they also started assessing strength later, and uh, then they track them uh, and see how long they live, see what health problems come up. And it turns out, if you were in the uh, low level of cardiorespiratory fitness compared to the high level, people in the high level of fitness have 75% lower mortality over the next 10 years. All right, so exercise and fitness does have a huge impact, but uh, just more and more fitness is, is not better. All right, so what happens when we look at different levels of activity? Well, it basically follows a line like that red line that I've gone. As you go up to about half an hour a day of moderately intense activity, you keep improving your health. But once you reach that point, then further uh, exercise increases your fitness, but it doesn't increase your health. It no longer reduces your risk of dying. All right, why is that? It's not fitness that prevents you from dying. It's circadian rhythm entrainment. And once you've gotten that 30 minutes of exercise, you've entrained your circadian rhythms as much as you're going to. All right. Another important conclusion, um, when we do a circadian rhythm and training thing, the effect persists for about 36 to 48 hours. All right. So what does that mean? If I exercise today, I get the benefits for 36 hours. All right. But then the, benefit, the benefits have lapsed. I need to exercise again in order to get the benefits. All right. And it's the same with all of the other circadian rhythm and training things. You need to do them every day. If you miss one day, then you have to say, I'm absolutely not going to miss the next day. Never miss two days in a row. All right, then you've uh, totally lost the benefits. Another key element, social interactions. We're social creatures. Um, we need to have social interactions. And if we don't get them, uh, it damages our health significantly. All right, so we need social engagement, but Curiously, uh, we don't necessarily need engagement with actual human beings. Uh, so in some experiments, it turns out that if you look at human faces, hear human voices, if you watch television, uh, you watch movies, uh, you can uh, entrain, you know, your brain can be fooled into thinking you're getting social interaction, social engagement, and you can uh, improve your health. It's very important that these social interactions happen during the day. Uh, all of your stressful interactions should be in the daytime. Uh, in nighttime, you, want an, an, you don't need to avoid people at night, but your nighttime interactions, they should be intimate, comfortable, stress-free. All right? So um, now, often when I give these talks, uh, someone will ask a question, all right, what's the best time to have sex? All right? And then what I say is, well, uh, intimate, comfortable, uh, loving sex is great at any time. Uh, passionate, stressful sex only in the daytime. All right, so. OK. Um, now, all of these uh, daytime and training things, you need to concentrate them in the daytime and not do them at night.